Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and this is the second video in the model development series. Um, this one focuses again on data cleaning, but it's data cleaning part two. And this one will discuss just outliers, how to handle them, and what to do with them, and why you should trim them, why you shouldn't trim them. So let's dive right in here. So in discussing outliers, there are two different topics that you should look at on how they impact a model or the data itself. And this is influence and leverage. Um, I'm going to throw a link below. There's a video another guy made. It's a great video. It explains it better. It has even the mathematical equations. But I'm not going to get into the actual calculations or leverage and influence in itself. So there's two different types, I guess, of outlier reduction that I have seen. Um, there's trimming and there is capping, they are essentially the same thing. However, capping typically just applies some standardized rule. Um, so for example, uh, trim off the top 1% and the bottom 1%, and then that is the capping and flooring. So it's capping and flooring, two different things, but more or less, you end up with trimming off the top and the bottom, and that reduces outliers in itself. So the second type is actually outlier trimming. Uh, trimming itself is usually done when you plot out data, uh, you look for the outliers and then you trim them manually. I would view capping and flooring as taking off entire groups at a time, which is more or less the difference. Trimming is one or two data points at a time, whereas capping and flooring is some general rule that takes off a whole group of outliers or variables or observations. So one more definition I'd like to define before we really get diving deep into this is variables versus residuals. Um, so trimming or capping, I'm just gonna call it trimming probably for the rest of the video. But more or less when you're getting rid of outliers, you can consider more or less the data prep, which is the data cleaning process, which we're talking about now. And this would apply to the variables. However, also when people build models, they'll actually look at the residuals. And if there is an outlier or an extreme residual, uh, they typically will trim that in industry or practice. Uh, the idea is to get more or less nice looking residuals, something that is random and follows a normal distribution, uh, which is part of the base assumptions in many linear models. So the first example here is univariate or just having one variable plotted against um, a Y, so you have like an X and a Y, something you're modeling, you're dependent against your independent. You can see on the chart on the left that there is an outlier, which I have colored red. And we're gonna look at more or less the impact when you remove this one outlier. Um, you can see here in the plots that the beta coefficient for plot one or the slope of X in relationship to Y is 1.8699. Um, you can see in the plot number two, which is with the outlier removed, that the slope coefficient changes to 2.2996. Um, you can also see from these models, if you just plot a linear line, use OLS, and take the R squared value, that it improves from 0 0.6272 up to 8943. So in this case, it looks amazing. It's added value, you trim this one point, uh, the fit gets better, uh, and then the slope changes. So this looks great, right? Well, that's not necessarily true. Um, there are a few different things and issues with trimming outliers in general. A is if this data point is wrong or a mistake, we should definitely trim it. Uh, if this data point is a real data point, there could be a piece of the population that you're missing. Perhaps the sampling that was done to get this data was not done independently or IID. And so if it is not done in this correct manner, you actually might have a larger population that centers around that outlier and it may not be an outlier within itself. So if this isn't a true outlier and a mistake and it is trimmed, you can see there is improved performance. However, if it is not actually an outlier in the sense that it's actual data, you should keep this data point in the model for a variety of reasons. One of them being, like I mentioned, is there could be a subpopulation. So then the second question arises, how many outliers do you trim? Because you can take a line and you can fit it like in these plots below, and you can trim the first outlier. And then now you see here that we trim two outliers. And again, if you look at the previous slide, the R squared on the one with the one trimmed outlier is 0.8943. However, when we trim two outliers, we get an increase of 0.9268 as the new R squared. So clearly, the more we trim away from it, the better the fit's getting. And so the question is, how many should you trim? 
Um, this is when rule-based trimming comes into play, which is a lot of people do either one standard deviation, two standard deviations, or they use the capping and flooring at say like half a percent or a percent on top or bottom. And so you can end up getting a rule to prevent you from either over trimming or under trimming. However, when you keep trimming these data points, you're more or less approximating some mean and you're losing the variance in the data. Uh, the variance itself in data is information. And so when you reduce the variance, you're losing information and value that this model holds. And so now you're just getting an average. And so if you're going to do this, you might as well just blindly take the averages of all these different points, strip away all of the outliers or any data that moves your line in a way that you don't feel is appropriate. But at the end of the day, you're going to get a garbage model. It's not going to respond well. You're not going to have enough sensitivity uh, to results or to extreme cases. And this comes into play, especially in risk modeling for finance, because we're trying to model those one-off, those bad events. However, you're also trying to model more or less different events in other scenarios. So the second point here is to look at also the intercepts. The intercepts change signs. And so in the plot number one here, you see that it's a plus 21. And the plot number two, it's a negative seven. So again, this has impact depending on the theory behind the model. Having a positive or a negative value could actually mean something different and give you significantly different conclusions based on the model itself. And you can also see here that the intercept changes from 20 in plot three to negative 10 in plot four. So next we're going to look at multivariate, which I have not really seen a lot of information on. However, it's easier to view more or less kind of the X and Y axis and plotting the two of them together and looking at the trimming in itself. Uh, this can be done again with uh, X and Y, so an independent and dependent variables, or it can be done with uh, dependent variables and the residuals themselves. However, we're gonna look at a multivariate case. I'm going to try to approach this a little bit differently just so you can see the impacts on a multivariate model. This model has two independent variables and one dependent variable. And again, in this case, we're going to trim away two points. The two red points on the left here, uh, those go with the orange data and the orange line or the Z variable. And the two green points are going to be outliers that we trim that are with the X variable. And again, the two red and the two green match on observations, and so they're going to be taken out together. So we're just basically getting rid of two observations or two rows in our data set. You can see here that the beta coefficient for the data before these outliers are removed is one point, negative 1.5442. Uh, the R squared is 7825. And again, we trim these two observations or four data points in general, and we end up with a beta coefficient of negative 1.5503 with an R squared of 0.79. Again, these aren't significantly different results. However, you do see that the fit improves, and it's important to note that the beta coefficients and the intercepts are slightly changing. So now we create a basic OLS model and we regress the results with the original data and then with the data that has been trimmed and the outliers have been removed. Again, you can see the adjusted R squared of the original model is 0.91. The adjusted R squared of the trimmed one is 0.95. And again, you can view the coefficients for both models, the original one on the left and the trimmed ones on the right. Again, these don't seem too significant. The signs have not changed. Uh, the values have improved slightly here and there. And again, to note on the bottom, all p-values for both models were less than 0.05, which is our typical threshold we use. So with the multivariate case here, you see it's a little more complex. It's two variables um, that are impacting the final output or the dependent variable. Um, again, we only trimmed two data points and there was minimal changes. However, if the influence was significantly higher or the leverage was significantly higher of these data points, it could drastically change the final model. And this is especially true for variables where the slope coefficients would change as the interpretation of the model and the inputs would change based on what we originally thought. So in this case, it could be extremely dangerous to be trimming if it's not an appropriate use. So let's get back to the pros and the cons here. The pros of trimming is that inaccurate data can be removed, which will improve the accuracy of the model and the results and the readability of the results. 
The second pro is that you have better model fit and you approximate the averages better. So there are scenarios where models are required and needed where the averages are approximated and the extreme outliers on both the low end and high end aren't really necessary and aren't desired from a modeling perspective. The cons though is this results in cherry picking of results. So as I have here in bold and red on the bottom, never trim data to get the desired results. I see this consistently throughout industry. I see this in different academic papers that have been criticized by their peers, that people actually cherry pick results. And so they go in and they remove outliers one by one, and they look to see if the logic behind the model matches what they're expecting. Um, this is extremely wrong. It should not be done in industry. It should not be done in practice. And those that have done this and have been caught should be punished severely. Uh, the second con here is that extreme conditions are missed. So again, we look at the financial crises and in banking, we're typically modeling extremes. It's great when you have great model fit, your R squared is high or your residual mean squared error. However, that being said, sometimes you're missing those extreme values. And when you trim one or two data points, you think like, oh, it's just one or two data points in these examples. However, there's only 30 observations. So that's one thirtieth. And this results in a little more than 3% of the data being trimmed. And so you have to look at this both from a percentage and a total. And like I've said, when you have like 100,000 observations, people say like, oh, we only trimmed you know, half percent on top, half percent on bottom. But numerically, you just trimmed 1,000 observations. So are those 1,000 accounts all very similar? Are those all, like in a credit example, are those all the worst loans? And so now you're taking out the worst loans and not modeling your losses appropriately? This can be a case that happens, especially in finance as well as other industries. And it's important to take the considerations on why you are trimming these. Are you trimming these because they are mistakes? Or are you trimming these just because you want an easier and better fitting model? You want it easier to present to management and other modelers that, hey, look, you know, my fit is great and amazing. My coefficients look great. And so you're doing this to make yourself look good. And this is a wrong reason. You should be focusing on getting good models based on the data and not manipulating the data to get the desired result. And then the third and final point is that valuable information is lost. And I will drive this home over and over and over again as I don't see enough of this in academia or in industry. And this is the fact that information is actually in the data. When you transform data or you trim data, you are losing valuable information. And again, if these are mistakes, uh, these are calculation errors or something is wrong, you definitely should be trimming these. Get rid of them. It's bad data. And that's the data cleaning process. However, if you're just trimming these different results or just transforming data just for the fun and sake of making your life easier, making the model itself look better without consideration to the data quality, you're going to get results that aren't necessarily accurate and might mislead those that are using your model. So those are the pros and cons of trimming outliers. Again, I would just like to say, more or less, this is way over abused in industry. I see developers that just magically go in and they tr do capping and flooring or they do trimming of outliers on entire data sets. They don't even consider what variables are involved. They don't even look at the mins and maxes, which is the video before this. So if you go up here and click this button, you'll see a video on the data cleaning process, but don't be blindly cleaning data. Don't be blindly trimming outliers. Think about the logic behind why you're trimming these and if it's necessary. The typical BS of it's industry best practice is complete nonsense. You guys need to wake up and start building models based on intuition and logic and not based on what everybody else is doing. So those are my thoughts and opinions on outliers and trimmings, when you should trim them, when you shouldn't trim them, and a little bit of a view of the impact both in a univariate case and in a multivariate case. Thanks for watching guys and as always, until next time. Thanks for watching my video. If you find it helpful, please like, share, and subscribe.